Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. We've previously looked at the idea of a Fourier transform that would take a function in the time domain x of t and convert it into the frequency domain by multiplying it against e to the minus j omega t over the range of t. We could come from the frequency domain back into the time domain by multiplying against e to the plus j omega t, integrating over the range of omega. The inverse Fourier transform needs a 1 over 2 pi in front. The 1 over 2 pi is needed to get the math to work out. It doesn't really hurt anything. It's hard to keep track of, but if you don't put it in there, you'll wind up trying to take a transform and then take an inverse transform, and you'll get a 2 pi in the answer that you don't want. You can think of the 2 pi as a friend of your roommate's, and the friend of the roommate is just coming to stay for a few days, and they're crashing on the couch, but they never seem to quite leave, and they're not really hurting anything per se, but, you know, they're not actually contributing to the rent. But anyway, we've previously looked at the example of taking the Fourier transform of a decaying exponential. Here, I would like to see what happens if we take the Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform of delta functions. So here I'll have a delta landing at t naught. Over on the other side, I'll see what happens if we take the inverse transform of delta omega minus omega naught. So taking the transform on the left, we'll integrate between minus infinity and infinity of delta t minus t naught, integrated against e to the minus j omega t dt. So now I can use the trick that a delta function times another function admits a simplification. The delta function will only turn on at t naught, so I can take that t naught and substitute it in for t. Once I do that and I get an e to the minus j omega t naught, I can pull that out in front of the integral, and then I'm left with integrating a delta function over its full range. It gives me one. So I'm left with the answer of, and I'm left with the answer e to the minus j omega t naught. So a delta function in the time domain turns into a complex exponential, i.e. a complex sinusoid in the frequency domain. Now if I go over to the right, let's see what x of t is. It's very much like what's on the left, except I have to be careful not to forget this 1 over 2 pi. And here we're substituting in delta omega minus omega naught for big X of j omega. And now we're integrating it against e to the plus j omega t d omega. This delta function only turns on at omega naught. It's zero everywhere else. So I can effectively plug this omega naught in for omega. I'm then left with an e to the plus j omega naught t, which is a constant with respect to omega. So I can pull that in front of the integral. What I'm left with is a delta function, a delta function that's integrated over its range, which gives me 1. So I'm left with, as a final answer, 1 over 2 pi, e to the plus j omega naught t. We have a new set of Fourier transform pairs. So delta t minus t naught will Fourier transform into e to the minus j omega t naught. And also looking at this transform here but going the other direction, we have e to the plus j omega naught t in the time domain will Fourier transform into delta omega minus omega naught in the frequency domain with the caveat that I have forgotten something fairly important. I forgot the 1 over 2 pi that's ending in front here. Usually you don't see it written exactly like this in Fourier transform tables. Remember Fourier transforms are linear, so I can multiply both sides here by this 1 over 2 pi and write this as e to the plus j omega naught t. Fourier transforms into 2 pi times delta omega minus omega naught. Notice we have an interesting symmetry here. Delta functions in time turn into complex sinusoids in frequency. Complex sinusoids in frequency turn into delta functions in time. There are a few differences. There's a 2 pi that's different here or there. There may be some differences in signs here and there. It shouldn't be surprising that we have this kind of symmetry, given that the forms of the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are so similar, modulo this 1 over 2 pi and these differences in sign.
One subtle point is that I took integrals of delta functions. If we tried to go to the other direction, we would immediately run into trouble. Suppose we wanted to take e to the j omega naught t and find its Fourier transform directly using the Fourier transform integral. Well, at first glance, this shouldn't seem too terrible. Spoiler alert, it becomes terrible. We would integrate from minus infinity to infinity e to the j omega naught t times e to the minus j omega t dt. And then we could combine what's in the exponent. We could write this as e to the j omega naught minus omega t dt. We could do the indefinite integral and write this as e to the j omega naught minus omega t all over j omega naught minus omega. We'll plug in the limits, t going from minus infinity to infinity, and then you immediately run into trouble because you're like, whoa, what would it mean to plug in infinity here? The mathematics required to tackle this kind of integral directly is well beyond both the scope of this course and my brain. And if you did go to a math professor to try to tackle this, they would say, hey, you're an engineer. You should recognize that this mess here is a Fourier transform operation and look up the answer in a Fourier transform table. So we will always see this interesting symmetry. But remember, these computations are usually easiest done on a particular functional form. Here it's much easier to do it with the delta function. So there's some obvious special cases here. We can say that delta t transforms into the number 1, because that's what you get if you plug in 0 up here. Similarly, we could plug in 0 for omega naught and wind up writing that 2 pi delta omega would inverse transform back into the constant 1, because that's what you get if you plug in 0 here. So deltas at the origin and constants are pairs of each other. And this is really a remarkable thing. Deltas and constants, conceptually speaking, couldn't be more different. And think about what this kind of pair means for a second. If we wanted to take the inverse transform of the constant 1, we would write x of t is equal to 1 over 2 pi, delta going from minus infinity to infinity, e to the j omega t d omega. Now think about that for a second. Okay, so let's try to make some sort of sense of this. So if I think about this for a second, I could kind of split this up into two different integrals. I could have an e to the j omega t d omega, and then I could also have a 1 over 2 pi integral from minus infinity to 0 e to the j omega t d omega. And I can get away with this because there's no delta function sitting at 0, so it's okay if I repeat that. I can say, let's rewrite this as an integral from 0 to infinity of e to the j omega t. And then to handle this one over here, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and have the integral here still go from 0 to infinity, but I'll write this as e to the minus j omega t d omega. And this whole thing will then turn into 1 over 2 pi integral of cosine omega t d omega going from 0 to infinity. And that's just remarkable. What this is telling me that I could construct a delta function. Remember, this is delta t here. By taking every possible cosine at every possible frequency with the magnitude 1 over 2 pi, all of them have the same magnitude, I add up all the possible cosines, and I'll get a delta function. Think about what that looks like for a second. So. I'll have a slow going cosine. Okay, that wasn't a very good cosine. I might have a medium speed cosine. Okay, this isn't terribly to any sort of scale or decent sense of artistry or anything. I'll then have maybe a really fast going cosine. Woo, look at how fast this cosine is. Okay, this is a horrible mess, so just ignore all this. Instead, picture in your head all the possible cosines at every possible frequency all adding up. And then, out of adding all of those up, you get a delta function. You get this thing that at zero is infinite, quote unquote, although we've talked a lot about how you really need to put that infinity in big quotes because trying to treat it as a quote unquote number infinity can get you into trouble.
But it kind of makes sense because the only thing that's really common of all of these cosines is that cosine of zero equals one. Somehow, magically, at all of these other points in here, this uncountably infinite number of cosines adds up to give you zero. That is just the most bizarre thing. Okay, let's compute a couple more Fourier transform pairs. Let's try to find the Fourier transform of cosine omega naught t. The first thing you might think to do is to just blindly plug cosine omega naught t into the Fourier transform integral. However, this would be kind of tricky to integrate directly. If you tried to tackle this directly, that would involve probably integration by parts, which is a bit painful. Another thing you might do is to say, well, let's take the cosine and rewrite it with Euler's formula, and then take these various exponents, combine them with this exponent, and then do the integration, and then plug in the limits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's also pretty painful. And whichever of those approaches you used, you would run into all sorts of weirdness about what happens when you plug t equals minus infinity and t equals infinity into the resulting indefinite integral. It requires a lot of weird math to try to tackle that directly. So you might guess we're not actually going to try to tackle this directly. Instead, let's try rewriting cosine omega naught t using Euler's formula, but let's not actually plug it into that big complicated integral focus a bit on doing something a bit more clever. So the idea here is that we can take the Fourier transform of each individual bit. I'll have the Fourier transform of e to the j omega naught t plus the Fourier transform of e to the minus j omega naught t. And from the homogeneity property, the scaling property, I can just pull the one out, out in front. And then I remember that I have a Fourier transform pair that we computed earlier that said e to the j omega naught t transforms into 2 pi omega minus omega naught. We can write our Fourier transform of cosine omega naught t as 1 half 2 pi delta omega minus omega naught plus 1 half 2 pi delta omega plus omega naught because that's what we would get if we plug this minus omega naught in for omega naught. Remember the omega naught here is different than the omega naught here. And while well, I just get some canceling happening and I wind up with the final Fourier transform pair cosine omega naught t transforms into pi delta omega minus omega naught plus pi delta omega plus omega naught. I won't go through it here, but you can use the same Euler's formula trick on the sine function and write sine omega naught t Fourier transforms into minus j pi delta omega minus omega naught and plus j pi delta omega plus omega naught. And I'll leave the proof of this as an exercise for the reader.